A very good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank our secretary, uh, Dr. R. S. Praveen Kumar sir, for launching this wonderful program, Gnana Diksha, on TSAT. It's a great privilege to be a part of this program, Gnana Diksha, which is trying to reach out every house of Telangana state with its educative program for our young swaros. So students, I know you must be missing your school, teachers, friends, classroom, and playing in that ground. So here I'm going to tell you a small story of a boy named Harry. Harry is a boy just like you. He too is missing his school, he's stuck at his home due to this lockdown, and he is vexed of this innumerable holidays, which is, you know, um, keeping him at home not allowing him go out. So every day he dreams of the normal life, going back to school, playing in the ground, listening to the classes of their teachers. Finally, one day, his dream comes true. One bright summer morning, news comes that the lockdown has come to an end and people can begin their normal life. And it's Harry's turn to rush to the ground and see his dream, dream come true. And to his surprise, he sees his friends joining him in his merriment. And he enjoys the lovely atmosphere of the ground, the playground, the garden, the lush green uh, garden and the trees. And he enjoys the melodious sweet song of the chirping birds, the cool breeze. And this is how his day passes. And he had his whole day passing as if just in a wink of an eye. Finally, at the end of the day, he returns home. And when he returns home, he is quite elated. But then the phone rings. And you know who's on the line? It's his English teacher. And they, here's the conversation between Harry and his teacher. Teacher, Harry, come on, quickly. Give me the report of your work today. Harry. Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm ready with it. But uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that I had a lovely day out. I enjoyed in the garden playing with my friends. The teacher says, oh, that's great. But please quickly send me a report. I need to inform to the principal. I need to report her. Uh, ma'am, that's, that's what I'm telling you. Uh, I, I played with my friends under the shade of huge trees until it was dark. The teacher said, Harry, I understood, but please tell me about your work. Ma'am, that's what I'm doing. You remember the other day you asked me to identify parts of speech in a lesson? And that's what I did. I is a pronoun, played, verb, joyfully, adverb, with, preposition, friends, noun, in, preposition, uh, green, adjective, again ground, uh, noun and until it is conjunction. The teacher said, wow, Harry, that's a great job. You've done your lesson in such a playful way. And Harry, yes, ma'am. Wow, ma'am, I missed it. Wow is a conjunction. Uh, wow is an interjection. So to this, the teacher was quite amazed and could, uh, you know, couldn't hold her uh, excitement to appreciate Harry that he learned his lesson in such a playful way. So I guess you must have, uh, I know you must have guessed the topic today, that is parts of speech. So today we are going to do parts of speech. First of all, why do we need parts of speech? Parts of speech is a, uh, uh, if you look into the meaning of this uh, title, speech, what do you mean by speech? Speech is a sentence. A sentence is a group of words and each word has its own uh, function. So, to understand the system of a language, we should know the function of its words. English is a foreign language. We are not the native speakers of English. So, in order to learn to speak correct English, we all speak English, but we always try to, you know, uh, improve our accuracy in speaking English. So, in order to speak accurate and fluent English, we should know its system because English is not our native language. So here, with the help of parts of speech, we can learn to speak fluent and correct English. 
So let us begin. There are eight parts of speech, noun, pronoun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, interjection. The first one is noun. What is there in the name? It's just a basket until you put something into it. So noun, can you imagine your world without names? How would you ask for your favorites without naming them? Hence, names are very important. And noun is a word which denotes the name. And noun denotes the name of person, thing, place, animal. As you can see in the example, the name of person like mother, teacher, doctor, boy, girl. OK, these are the names given to persons based on their profession, relation, or age. OK, things, book, apple, car, hat, house, pet, all these are names. Then animals names you can see. And the place, city, village, school, zoo, classroom, all these are names. OK, the noun is again divided into several uh, types. Common noun, proper noun, abstract noun, collective noun, material noun. So let us look into the first one. First type of noun, it's common noun. Names given to things, persons, animals, places belonging to a certain category, like girl, a young girl of, you know, it's a feminine gender of young age is called a girl. Similarly, boy, masculine gender, male, a boy. Then car, a four-wheeler in which we uh, move from one place to another. It's a car. It's the name of an uh, object. Bulb, tree, book, table, chair, camera, lights, everything. These all are nouns. Okay. Then look at the examples given in the sentences. The book is on the table. The book, the word book and table are common nouns. Children love cartoons. Children and cartoons are the common nouns. The next. So this is what we see in the common noun. And then next we have proper noun. Proper nouns. Can you, uh, you know, how would you feel if people call you by common nouns? Hey boy, hey girl, would you like that? Never. We have special names. We have such lovely names, isn't it? So how proud we feel when people call us with our names. So those are the specific or special names given to persons. So proper noun is Specific, uh, are nothing but specific names given to things, persons, places, and so on. So you, as you can see in the picture, India is the name of a country. Ours is a great country, right? Then Taj Mahal is the name of a great monument. Then William Shakespeare, name of a great English writer. Then Eiffel Tower, it's the name of a great tower. Look at the sentences now. John is a great singer. John is proper noun. And at the same time, you can find out a common noun, singer. Singer is like a, you know, a profession or you can say career. So singer is the common noun. Similarly, Nile is the longest river, the Nile. So Nile is a proper noun given to a river. River is a common noun. So that is the difference. Then specific names given to proper nouns. Now, uh, you know the different companies, Samsung, Sony, LG, Godrej, all these are the brand names or companies names. Uh, if I serve you noodles, I wonder if you take it. But if I say it's Maggie noodles, you would just grab it. So that's the, you know, power of, you know, that's the magic of proper noun. The next, we have collective nouns. Okay. Collective nouns are the names given to groups, uh, group of things, persons, animals, etc. As you see in the picture, flock of birds, there's so many birds together. So it's a collection of birds, flock of birds, bunch of keys, herd of elephants. Now, have you ever thought of this, uh, uh, you know, what might be going behind the screen, the TSAT program, uh, like how it is coming on uh, TV, telecasting the channel, the program every day. It's because of the collective work of so many people involved. So all the people form a committee. This committee is nothing but a collective noun. Your class, your students studying in the same class, class is a co collective noun. Your family. You know, the siblings, parents living together. It's a family. It's again a collective noun. So you see the collective nouns in your daily life. So many. So that is 
collective noun. We must be very careful while uh, using verbs with collective nouns. Usually if I say flock of bird is flying in the sky. Flock of birds. Birds are so many but flock is one group. Hence we use singular verb that is is. We cannot say flock of birds are flying. Birds, you know, you may get confused that birds is a plural word. So, you would use are. No. Flock. The group is one. So, flock of birds is flying in the sky. Bunch of keys is lying on the table. Okay. Herd of elephants is passing through the jungle. So, you know, you should be very careful about using the singular or plural verbs. Suppose if it is flocks of birds, then you can use are. I mean, plural sense. So, that is collective noun. The next one is abstract noun. Now, names given to things which cannot be perceived with our sense of organs. You know, five sense of organs, you cannot touch, feel or see them. So, such things are named under abstract nouns. Name of things which do not have physical structure. They do not have physical structure. Example, love, peace, beauty. Now, you know, I see a beautiful painting. It's, I, I feel it is beautiful. So, the painting is beautiful for me, but it may not be beautiful, beautiful for everybody. Because beauty, you know, the feeling of beauty is my personal opinion. So, it's a feeling which I cannot show, which I can just express that yes, it is beautiful, but I cannot show it, right? So, the beauty, love, peace, peace can be felt, but you cannot show. You cannot show physical structure of beauty, uh, peace and love. So, uh, some examples in the sentence, if you look at health is wealth. Health and wealth, both are abstract nouns. You cannot show them. Then honesty is the best policy. Honesty, can you show honesty? It's a, it's a character. You cannot show the character. Always speak the truth. Truth, you know, it's a value, it's a virtue. You cannot show. Similarly, if you look at the picture, happiness, favorite, friendship, love, excitement, talent, childhood, all these can be just, you know, experienced, but you cannot show them. Hence, they are called abstract nouns. There is no plural sense of abstract nouns. You cannot say, uh, you know, health or honesty. There is no plural, uh, plural sense for abstract nouns. They are always in singular. The next one is material nouns. Names given to things, uh, material or substance as a whole. Like, it cannot be divided into numbers. So, uh, for example, if you look at the picture, cotton iron, fleur, gold, these cannot be, you know, uh, this, these are taken as a whole, jute, rubber, paper, etc. They are in the form of material from which another substance is produced. Like from gold, we, we get uh, gold ornaments, iron, iron, you know, the, or iron objects, floor, we make uh, chapatis, cotton, we make fabric and then clothes. So, a table is made of wood. Gold is a precious metal which is used to make gold ornaments. So, these uh, material nouns cannot be taken in plural form. Again, there is no plural form for material noun. So, you can see in the example. Then, there is one more interesting division of uh, nouns. They are countables and uncountables. I think you can make it by looking at the picture. Uh, under uh, countables, look at the picture. There's a, there are one, two, three, four, five birds, five flowers, a chair, then five students, uh, and uh, balloons and books. So all these are countable, right? You can count them into one, two, three, four, and so on. So these, the nouns, the things which you can count in number, are known as countables. Then the other way, if you look at uh, uncountables, can you count them? like chemical, water, coal, iron, rice, fabric. Is there anything which can be separately counted? No, these cannot be counted. Hence, the nouns which cannot be counted are known as uncountables. They can just be measured. They cannot be counted, but they can be measured. Like water, you can, if you want water, you'll ask for one glass of water or one liter. Okay, so the measurement is different, but you cannot count them. So that is the difference between uh, countables and noun, uh, uncountables. So, noun, we have seen common noun, proper noun, collective noun, proper noun, collective noun, and abstract noun, and then material noun. And then uh, we have countables and uncountables. The next, we have pronouns. Pronouns are useful 
only if they are combined with the words like, I have a few, I can give you if you are at loss. I and you can make this world a beautiful place. You see, the words look so beautiful. I and you together can do something great. So yes, pronouns are the words which are used instead of nouns. Instead of repeating the nouns again and again, we can use pronouns. For masculine gender, we use he. And for uh, feminine gender, we use she. Okay. So the examples, if you look in the picture, I, you, he, she, it, we, they. And the sentences, we must follow traffic rules. We, collectively, the first person in, if it is more in number, we say we. Then he, a masculine gender pronoun, he knocked at the door. They won the match. They is the plural sense of third person. Okay, like when we talk about the other person, either he or she, or we talk about them collectively, then we use the pronoun they. How do we use pronouns? The personal pronoun, they went to the market. So they, I, we, you, she, it are actually used to denote uh, the word instead of nouns for persons. Instead of uh, the name of a boy, we use he. Name of a girl, we use she. Name of persons, we use they. Name of a thing, we use it. So we replace the names by using the personal pronoun he, she, it, they, you and all. Okay. Now demonstrative. What is demonstrative? Demonstrative means to show, to show, to show something which is, you know, in, lying in front of you. Uh, if it is near, we use this or the, uh, these. The, you know, the book is lying on the table quite near to me. So what do I say? This is my book. Or if it is far, then I say that is my book. Similarly, the pl plural sense, these are my books. Then that, th those are my books. Okay, then interrogative. The words we use like who, what, which, whom, these are the words we use to question about a noun and the answer will be the name of a person. Okay, so who broke the class? The answer will be a boy, some boy had broken the glass. So the boy is a common noun, I mean the noun. So instead of noun, when we ask the question what did we use? We used who. So who, what, which, where, uh, whom, whose, these all are interrogative pronouns. Similarly, relative pronouns. I know the boy who won the match. The word who actually belongs to interrogative, but here it is used in order to relate to the boy about whom we are talking in the sentence. I know the boy who won the watch. The boy who. So the word who relates to that boy. I know a girl who sings lovely uh, songs. So girl who again, isn't it? Then reflexive. Reflexive, the word suggests the action is reflecting back. It's reflecting, it's falling back. So the boy laughed at himself. The boy laughed at himself. The word himself suggests the action is reflecting on the person who is doing it. So the boy laughed at himself. If it is feminine gender, it is herself, plural, themselves, and uh, I, it is myself, ourselves, yourselves, on, so on. The next, uh, uh, just have a look at this personal pronoun table person there are three persons first person second person and third person first person is the speaker the one who is speaking now I am speaking so I am the first person second person is you you are listening right so you are the second person third person is about whom we are talking so the persons are again divided into three uh, the cases like subjective case objective case possessive case subjective case shows the pronoun in the position of doer of the action I sing a song. So I am doing the action, right? So I is singular in first person. Similarly, if you take the plural sense of I, it is we. We sing a song. Okay. Now objective case, if you take, she gave a book to me. I am receiving the book, right? So I am in the receiver's position. So I am the object of the sentence. So me, the first person, me in singular form. The plural of me is us. Similarly, possessive case, if you look at my, my is to denote possessiveness, like the book is, you know, the book belongs to me. So how would I say my book? 
if it belongs to us it is our book the same way you can look at the second person second person as i told you it's the listener you okay so you in singular and plural are both same in objectives case also i gave the book to you whether it is singular or plural it is the same similarly the possessive case again your book your car so again it's the same there is no uh, you know difference of singular and plural sense in you the second person then the third person is about whom we are talking so if it is masculine he feminine she it is a neutral you know when we talk about objects so those are things they don't have lives or even if we talk about animals we do not consider their the gen their genders we consider them in you know uh, it uh, as an object uh, like we use it and the plural sense of uh, the third person is they and then in objects case him i gave the book to him i gave the book to her okay so him and her in its uh, in objectives case and then what is a the plural them then again in the possessive case if you look at his car her hair its tail the wa dog wagged its tail isn't it there they like their new dress dresses okay so there is again a possessive case so that is what we have seen in pronouns uh personal pronoun demonstrative pronoun interrogative relative reflexive and the personal pronoun chart under subjective case objective case and possessive case then we have adjectives a person's character is learned from the adjective he uses in his conversation yes the words which we use to describe people and things around us actually denote our character the more the positive words we use the more elated uh, you know uh, elevated is our character character so words that describe something about noun or pronoun noun and pronoun what are nouns and pronouns we have already seen nouns are the names of persons place things and pronouns are the words which we use instead of nouns so when we use the words instead of uh, uh, you know, when we use to describe something about noun or pronoun like beautiful hair a good girl a tiny uh, book a blue ribbon isn't it so i ha i saw a huge elephant elephant is a noun the word which we use to describe elephant is huge huge denotes the size of elephant it's a huge elephant right then children like horror stories stories what kind of stories do children like horror stories so here the word huge or horror interesting good kind honest all these words describe the nouns okay so adjectives uh how do we use adjectives uh to describe different uh, characteristics of nouns the first example if you look at she has beautiful hair quality the quality of her hair is described in the sentence so here the adjective is used to describe the quality of hair she has beautiful hair beautiful is adjective of quality india's country india is a country of many languages quantity many few several so the words which we use to denote the quality a quantity of adjectives are many you know the word many here india is a country of many languages then there is a huge mountain in the in the forest so huge is again size the word size denotes the you know the word huge denotes the size of the mountain so the quality uh, adjective of size priya likes to wear blue jacket jacket so blue is the color of the jacket then there are seven colors in the rainbow so seven we also use adjectives to denote number i have two books okay i have serve, uh, i have eight uh, uh, chocolates so the words which uh, uh, you know the numerical words which we use to denote something about noun are you uh, adjective of number then nationality i like italian cheese so it it leaves a nation it's a name of a country but when we are talking uh, about uh, using the word to describe a noun then it becomes nationality so the adjective of nationality i like italian cheese italian is the uh, adjective of nationality so what did we see in adjectives adjectives uses of adjectives adjectives are used to denote quality quantity size color number nationality 
then we have verbs actions speak louder than words yes what we do is action so the words which denote actions are called verbs the verbs denote the actions or state of being so the action words are like play think write eat and so on look at the words in sentences harry plays cricket play play is an action priya wrote a letter right wrote is the past tense of right so wrote is an action mona is singing a song singing is also an action you can see the picture uh, with different characters doing different actions the verbs are also divided into three types there are main verbs auxiliary verbs modals main verbs are nothing but actions you know the actions which we do even when we are sitting still without doing anything there is some action going on what is that breathing you know you are not talking you are not doing any action but you are breathing breathing inhaling and exhaling is an action blinking your eyes that is an action so action is an inevitable part of our body and life so main verbs are again divided into three v1 v2 v3 is nothing but present v1 is present tense of the verb present then v2 is the past tense and v3 is the past participle future tense is denoted under modals will shall you know these are the words which we use for future reference v1 if you look at it's the present tense eat is the present form of the verb eat and what is the past tense of eat ate and the same if you take under past participle it is eaten i have eaten the cake now play played played here v1 is played v2 is played v3 is also played do you see some difference here ate and eaten when they are changing from present to past there's change in the spelling similarly when v2 is uh, you know uh, v3 is forming when the tense is ch changing from v1 to v2 v2 v3 that is present to past participle it is eaten so there is lot of variation in the spelling so when the spelling the change of spelling is irregular these are known as ir irregular verbs whereas in play if you see just ed is added at the end so this pattern of change where there is a slight change just adding ed to the word to change its form from present to past and past participle then it is called regular verb so regular verbs just add ed at the end and then the tense changes whereas irregular there is uh, you know little more variation in the spelling similarly if you look at think thought thought cut 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 here the spelling doesn't change okay cut 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 hurt 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 put 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 so there are no variations of spellings in these words the next classification is auxiliary verbs be form when we talk about state of being i am happy she is happy they are happy or they were happy so am is was were uh, these are helping verbs they are supporting the main verbs main verbs are action verbs right then do form what is do doing an action she does the work they do the work they did the work so do form doing the action is denoted by do forms similarly possessing something i have something so uh, how do i say have has had these are the verbs we use helping verbs to denote the have form so she has a beautiful car i have uh, a story book they had their lunch long ago so these are the verbs which uh, uh, show the, denote the have form so the auxiliary verbs are again divided into be form do form and have form and then we have models will shall can may must would should could might and not now what do you why do we call them models is because they modify the sense of the sentence i will do the work there's certainty i shall do the work you know you are promising that you will do i can do the work you are showing that yes i am able i you are talking about your ability i may do the work maybe may or may not be probability i must do it is like compulsion so different verbs different modal verbs used in a sentence are actually modifying the certainty of an action will is most certain may is 
likely or may not you know unlikely to happen so hence they are called modal verbs so this is what we have learned in verbs the division of verbs main verbs auxiliary verbs and modal verbs the next we have adverbs any action if it is not performed at right time right place and in right manner is of no use that's why we say strike the iron when it is hot so adverbs are the words which describe something about the verb adverb and adjective what are the adverbs what do they do they as you see in the word itself add something to the verb adverb so the examples if you look at here now quickly very etc these are the adverbs adverbs are also used to describe how you perform an action okay meena is a meena is very beautiful beautiful is actually adjective but how beautiful very beautiful so that very matters the most for meena isn't it so very is a word which describes something about adjectives so as i told you it's there in the definition that adverb describes adjectives then she came here to see you here here is the place the action happened here so here is the place he is quite busy now busy is adjective so the word quiet is describing adjective and then now now when when the action takes place now so now is again adverb adverb of time so you see in the picture uh, here there are also kinds of ad uh, adverbs adverb of place adverb of time adverb of manner so the adverb is used to describe time of place of action time of action manner of action and frequency of action adverb of place if you look into here there outside forward near somewhere all these are adverbs of places they denote where the action has actually performed i live here he is waiting inside keep it there so in all the three words you see there is place so adverb denotes the place of action the next adverb of time when the action happened that is also very important the train will come soon the guests have come today they left before the sunset so soon today before sunset all these denote the time of action hence they are called the adverb of time the next one adverb of manner how the action has taken place the manner is very important you have done your work but how carefully you know uh, meticulously that matters if you have not done the work carefully you may have lot of mistakes so the manner is also very important rahul works smartly radha sings beautifully the girls danced gracefully if you remove all these adverbs then look at the sentence rahul works so what how does it matter works it's okay radha sings okay she sings but if i say radha sings beautifully oh let us listen to her the girls danced gracefully okay gracefully she danced very you know beautifully let us look at her you know performance so adverbs add beauty to your work adverbs speak the quality of your work hence adverbs are very important then we have adverb of frequency you know you do certain things several times okay so the frequency of an action i had been there once one time always speak the truth she seldom comes here so seldom is a word which means very rarely so this tells us about the frequency of an action how many times an action is performed it can be twice often often means uh, most of the time seldom means very rarely never means you know not at all it is never done so i had uh, the other examples of adverbs are always usually frequently often sometimes occasionally rarely never so these are the adverbs if you just go back kinds of adverbs adverb of place time manner frequency 
then we have prepositions as you see in the name the name itself suggests that it denotes the position or relation of persons of th or things which are used in the sentence to the other parts of the sentence so the examples of prepositions are to in at from by on across among and so on the train is on time on time if the train is not on time you know you will be very much worried so on time the word on suggests that yes it's a right time okay birds are flying in the sky where the birds are flying they are flying in the sky we sailed across the river we sailed into the river or we sailed across the, so the word across is the appropriate word okay that means you are able to cross the river only you only if you sail across the river so the right preposition there is across now look at this picture you will have a uh, more clear picture on the uh, you see the position of apple under each picture on so the apple is on the box inside if you see the apple is in the box then next to the box then in front of the box if you see the picture and correlate the preposition given there the apple is behind the box between between the two boxes then under the box and through the box and around the apples are around the box so by looking at this picture you can have a clear idea about you know the location different locations for different locations what are the prepositions we use then further how do we use at and on uh, at on and in to denote time at is used uh, actually at on in are used to denote specific time at and on at 2 o'clock at 10 am at noon so at 2 o'clock at 10 am at noon are these specific times timings isn't it so at is used to denote the specific time we met the minister at 3 pm at is the preposition used to denote the specific time at 2 o'clock at 10 o'clock the meeting is at 10 o'clock okay then on is used for specific day and date 12th january can we say at 12th january january no at monday no it's on so when we mention about a specific date or day uh, then we use on so on 12th january on monday my school reopens on 1st june 1st june is a specific date right so on 1st june in is used for non specific like morning 7 o'clock is a morning 7 am uh, 8 am 9 am is also a morning so we don't know what is the specific time so for non specific time we use in in the morning in january we don't know which day in january so what do we use in similarly in 2010 we don't know this you know uh, specific year uh, month or date in a, in the year 2010 so again we use in so most schools reopen in june the previous sentence the date was given 1st june so we used on in this sentence no date is given not specific so we use in so this is how we use at on in next since for from since is used to denote the point of time for is used for denoting period of time since morning since 8 am uh, since 8 in the morning or since 2012 i have been waiting for you since morning it's it denotes the action which started some time ago and it's still continuing so when we use uh, uh, to the uh, phrases like morning since uh, wh wh what time it started actually the point of time so it is uh, since and then Uh, period of time like ten years, four years, or ten days, a decade. Then we use period. Uh, we use the word for. The preposition used is for. Rao, uh, Mr. Rao has been living in Mumbai for ten years. You cannot say since ten years. It's wrong. It's for ten years. Then from the preposition from is used to denote the starting time. The classes will commence from Monday. From is the starting point. The day Monday. then at and on and uh, uh, at on and in are also used to denote place again similarly uh, for small places we use at like colony village town uh, we use at she lives at sd road at asranagar 
at uh, Maulali. So, these are small places, right? Then uh, on uh, and in, on and in are used for specific locations. The book is on the table, on, it is on the table above. The mother is in the kitchen. Okay, though it is a small place, kitchen is a small place, but we are talking about a specific location. Hence, we use in. And then, in is used to denote uh, about the big places like city, state, country. Sachin was born in India. There are many languages in our country, in India. So, in is used for big places. Then, beside and besides we a uh, lot of uh, students find or a lot of people find uh, you know a great uh, confusion in using the words like beside and besides between and among beside is a word there's no s just look at the difference between beside and besides beside is a word used to denote something which is next to adjacent to there's a big shopping mall beside my house that means it's near my house and besides has some other meaning besides is in addition to not only this but also that so besides house she sold the furniture that means she not only sold her house but also the furniture so it's like you know talking about something more or something else so that is the difference between beside and besides then between between is used when we are talking about two subjects like there was an argument between two friends two the number two is given so between is used when we are talking about two subjects but if it is more than two subjects we use among the teacher distributed the books among the students here number is not given hence we consider it is more than two if number two is given then we use between so next conjunctions conjunctions are the words which are used to combine words phrases, sentences. The conjunctions are very powerful words like they, they are used to combine you and me can make this world beautiful, is not it? The word and, you and me, and is the word which is joining two subjects. So, and is a conjunction. There are different types of conjunctions which we use in our conversation. We use conjunctions to uh, you know, uh, to give reason, to state condition, to say, uh, to talk about you know option. Okay, uh, I, the boy is rich, but he is not happy. So, boy is rich, he is not happy. These are two different sentences, but when we combine them by using but, it makes a complete sentence out of. Uh, combined out of two sentences. So, the boy is rich, but he is not happy. Then, uh, I went to market and brought some fruits. I went to market, I brought some fruits. These two are different sentences, but we, we can make them one sentence by using the word and. So, and is a word used to combine two different ideas. Similarly, we use conjunctions to uh, give an option like you can write a letter or send an email. So, or is a word used to combine two options like you can either write or send an email. So, or is a word which is used to state con uh, conjunction of option. Then conjunction of condition, if you work hard, you will pass. Your passing is dependent on the condition of working hard. Hence, the word if is a conjunction of condition. Then we have a reason. Sometimes, you know, we um, suppose you go late to the class and your teacher asks, why are you late? So, what do you say? Ma'am, I was late because uh, it was raining or because I missed my bus. So, what are you doing here? You are using a word to state a reason. So, because is a conjunction of reason. Similarly, we can use as since, therefore, these are also the conjunctions of reasons. Then conjunctions of contrast, we use conjunction for contrasting, for, be, for, be, for bringing two opposite ideas together, like the weather was hot, still the children played. So weather is hot, actually it is a negative uh, situation that children should not be playing in the hot weather, still they are playing, so the word still is a conjunction of contrast. She is rich 
but she is not happy again the word but is combining two sentences of contrasting ideas so but still yet are the words which we use to talk about opposite sensing sentences he is rich it is a positive sentence he is not happy it's a negative sentence so the combination of a positive and negative sentence we use but still yet and so on so the conjunctions are of uh, are used for different reasons like combining two similar ideas then to denote the contrast between opposite ideas and then to denote condition like if you fulfill one condition you get something or you uh, something happens then condition uh, conjunction of reason where you state a reason by giving uh, using the words like because as since therefore then conjunction of uh, uh, what do you say purpose or result the bus was late so i missed my class so the bus was late the result of this situation is you were late isn't it so conjunction is also used to denote the result of an action result of a situation so th these are the different types of conjunctions interjections now listen to certain words hooray wow boo ouch oops all these are you know uh, some meaningless words but do you know one thing that these meaningless meaningless words add a great sense to your expressions we express different words in different abnormal moods isn't it so interjection is a word interjection is a word which denotes these sudden or strong emotions like when you are excited when you are angry or when you are scared or when you are sad do you behave normally do you speak normally no there is some sort of abnormality in your emotions so these emotions are expressed by such meaningless words like hooray wow alas uh, wow okay hooray so these are the words which denote uh, the expressions or the strong or str strong or sudden emotions so wow what a lovely weather wow is an expression of surprise admiration isn't it you are surprised to look at a beautiful weather so wow is an expression of wonder or surprise then hooray we won the match hooray is an expression of excitement you are very happy you are overjoyed to have won the match so what is the word we use here hooray alas she lost her mother alas is an exp expression of grief sadness so alas is an expression of sadness ouch you stamped on my feet ouch is an expression of pain so here the word pain is you know the word ouch denotes the expression of pain so all these feelings are quite abnormal like when we uh, uh, have some abnormal feelings or emotions we speak some abnormal words so these are the expressions of interjections interjections are very important in language otherwise you know uh, you, if you listen to stories if there are no such interjections you would not enjoy the stories like you know the expressions of happiness grief excitement fear all such expressions are very much needed in your stories and in your uh, conversations this denotes the intensity of your emotion like wow what a lovely dress if you say oh your dress is beautiful does it sound more beautiful or like more expressive or wow what a lovely dress okay wow what a lovely dress so the impression of your speaking is elevated when we use such interjections okay so once again you can look at the pictures hooray we won the match it's an expression of joy she lost her match uh, sorry she lost her mother it's an expression of grief lost her mother it's a great loss it's it's a grief right so that is the expression alas then wow what a pleasant surprise wonder the word is used here wow bravo what a splendid performance bravo is a word of admiration then ouch as i told you you are stamping on my foot 
ouch is you know a painful expression so these are the words of uh, uh, interjections then as i uh, we just have a recollection of conjunctions to see the picture conjunction joins words phrases clauses together in a sentence harry went swimming after the school like harry went for swimming uh, he went for swimming after the school so these two sentences you can combine using after she got some balloons because it was her birthday if you take these two sentences separately she got some balloons she got some balloons because it was her birthday then she had a burger and a milkshake for her dinner so this is a combination if you separate them she had a burger for dinner she had a milk a milkshake for dinner so these two sentences make content quite bigger but you can shorten it by using conjunction so uh, the uh, the most uh, useful um, way we use conjunctions are to summarize a big content mostly when your teachers are teaching you some story or lesson or something they ask you to write the summary isn't it so conjunctions are very useful to make your summary so you should have a good knowledge of conjunctions to precise your content okay so these are the examples just i mentioned conjunctions to combine conjunctions for option you can write a letter or send an email then contrast he is rich but he is not happy so contrast i said as i told you he is rich but he is not happy then condition reason result result so these are the sentences which i have already explained and as i explained about the interjection now uh it's very uh, easy to identify pron uh, pronouns prepositions conjunctions verbs because they have uh, like especially pronouns and uh, conjunctions and prepositions and interjections are you know repeated words they are very less words we we can always uh, see them identify them easily in the uh, in a content but these nouns adjectives and adverbs they are uh, you know a, a huge collection they are innumerable so every time to identify a parts of speech we need to know the meaning of that word which is not always uh, possible unless and until you are thorough with the vocabulary but there are certain suffixes which can help you to identify the nouns like if you can see in the table ty ry ness tion sion ment hwod ship acy enc ency so if you add these suffixes to certain adjectives these are the words you find beauty bravery neatness collection submission you can see the uh, suffixes here ty ry in bravery neatness you see ness election you see tion submission you see sion department you see ment childhood so these are certain suffixes which can help you to identify the parts of speech even if you don't know the meaning of that word at least by looking at the suffixes you can identify that it is noun so you just have to uh, you know uh, get it Uh, thoroughly in your mind uh, the suffixes to identify the noun similarly we can identify the adjectives by using the words full o u s e n t i c and you can see the examples useful continuous eminent prolific elegant singular you can see the suffixes in these words f u l a n t and all that so this is how you can identify adjective and then adverb suffix to identify adverb like adding ly you can add ly to the word uh, to the adjectives and then it becomes an adverb soft softly continuous continuously kind kindly so this is how you identify the uh, certain parts of speech and then yes the assignment the eureka i have given you two tasks very interesting you can read five story the task one is you can read five interesting stories of your child choice and identify parts of speech and write them in a notebook where you leave one page for each parts of speech like you take a you know a thin notebook and you divide into eight segments and you write parts of speech eight you know noun pronoun and all that and every time you read a story you identify certain nouns you write on the page where you have written noun then pronoun then verb adverb and all that so finally you compile a book of so many parts of speech in one book that is your first task and the second task is compile a handbook with the posters of eight parts of speech including definitions 
examples with colorful images. You can uh, take some A4, uh, A4 size sheets and you just bind them and in each page you will write the heading noun, you will write the definitions, you will write examples and you will put some colorful pictures. You can draw them or you can cut from a newspaper, old newspaper and you can stick them. So in this way you compile a handbook for yours. Do you know who compiles handbooks? Handbooks are some resource books which are published by some great companies for teachers use. But you people are, you know, at this young age are going to make your own handbooks and use it for yourself, the, you know, the parts of speech. So these are the two tasks which I think you are going to enjoy and um, submit after you, after your schools reopen. So thank you students. Stay safe, stay, uh, stay home, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.